The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Gateway to Global Aging Data Advanced Webinar featuring harmonized um, stress variables. Uh, we're glad that you could join us today. Uh, this is an interactive webinar, so we would like you to participate um, throughout this webinar. Um, I am Dristen Phillips. I'm here at the University of Southern California. Also, Alexandra Croswell, um, who is at uh, the University of uh, San Francisco and is part of the Stress uh, Measurement Network, will also um, be presenting. So if you would like to um, ask us questions um, anywhere throughout today's webinar, uh, there's a couple ways that you can do that. Uh, you can type a question um, into the chat window. Uh, you can also ask a question through the questions box. Um, and currently, um, all attendees are uh, muted. Uh, but if you would like to ask a question just using your voice, uh, there's a, a raise hand button. If you want to raise your hand, I can unmute you. And you could just ask that question to us um, with your voice. Uh, there will also be a recording made of today's um, webinar. It will be uploaded. Um, to our website, the Gateway to Global Aging Data, uh, within 24 hours after the webinar. I'll also just briefly mention uh, that there is one handout associated with this uh, webinar, uh, and that is called uh, Advanced Stress Webinar 2018.doc. Um, if you wanted to follow along with this webinar or just have that um, later, uh, that is the STATA code that we will use um, for parts two and three of this webinar, for kind of the hands-on portion of the webinar. Um, <clears throat> it's called a .c .doc file, but actually that is a .do file. So if you download that file, you just want to change the, the extension, those last um, three letters, to .do instead of .doc, and that's data code. Uh, this data code will also be uploaded to the Gateway to Global Aging Data's um, uh, website. Uh, on our documents page after this webinar. So you could also just download it there if you didn't want to follow along. Uh, and following along is quite easy. You can just see what's going on. I'll be having my status screen open uh, so you can watch what I'm doing there. So thank you again for joining us. Uh, and I hope you enjoyed today's webinar. Uh, I think we're aiming for maybe around 50 minutes of webinar and then we'll take questions um, afterwards. So if you have some questions, um, uh, that you don't want to interrupt the webinar for, uh, that's fine, and we're happy to stay around and answer them afterwards. Um, so briefly, um, our agenda. So uh, the first thing we're going to do is Alexander is going to introduce to us the Stress Measurement Network, uh, which uh, we have been working with um, uh, for a few years now uh, to develop this set of harmonized stress variables, which we're just beginning to release. And we're really excited about that. And so Alexandra is going to talk to us about that initiative and those variables that we created. Uh, the second thing we're going to do is using Stata, we're going to do a little uh, sample analysis using the harmonized HRS. Uh, that is a user-friendly version of the HRS that's produced uh, at the gateway to, as part of the Gateway to Global Aging Data Project. Um, and then thirdly, uh, we're going to do some cross-study analysis using the harmonized uh, HRS and the harmonized ELSA. Uh, ELSA is, uh, <clears throat> is kind of the HRS sister study that's conducted um, in England. Um, uh, HRS, if you're unfamiliar, is a, a longitudinal aging study that's conducted here in the Uni uh, United States out of the University of Michigan. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Alexandra, and she can begin to talk, you, uh, talk to you about... Um, uh, these new variables we've made and the stress measurement network. Great. Thanks, Tristan. This is Alexandra Crosswell speaking. I'm an assistant professor at the University of California, San Francisco, and also the executive director of the NIA funded stress measurement network. The stress measurement network was started uh, at the National Institute of Aging with the idea that we really want to improve the ability to measure experiences of psychosocial stress exposures and responses to those stressful exposures in large epidemiological studies and measure them in a very in a really valid way. Uh, next slide. So there's three aims of our network which started four years ago. Uh, the first aim is to conduct original research by funding pilot and validation studies to develop and refine measurement tools. The second was to create a curated toolbox of expert selected psychological stress measures. And also we do provide summaries of stress related biomarker measurements. 
um, and other physiological stress measures. The, I hope that you will look at our website, which is stresscenter.ucsf.edu, in order to take a look at this toolbox. If you're ever wondering about not just how to measure stress, but what different stress measures are actually measuring, that's what we try to provide in our toolbox. Um, and so we have a wide variety. I think we have over 30 entries of different types of stress that can be measured um, and a description of how to best measure those and the different nuances between the measurement uh, tools. Now, all of these network aims are listed as number one. That is not a typo. It's so that you see that each of these is actually equally as important. And so the final one, um, but again with equal importance, is this harmonization effort. And the idea that we had when partnering with the Gateway to Global Aging, which is Tristan's team led by Jin Cook Lee at USC, was to look across all about 10 large population-based studies to see if we could figure out what stress measures are the same across all of those studies so that we'd be able to harmonize across those variables uh, in order to be able to look at cross national differences um, and compare and hopefully uh, validate some findings that we had seen um, in the initial study, which did a fabulous job of capturing stress exposures and responses, responses, which is the health and retirement study. Next slide. So when we first began this project, we began with exploring what variables uh, measure and capture stress in the health and retirement study, which hopefully many of you know was de designed as an interdisciplinary study with a strong focus on health, retirement, and socioeconomic environment, and many psychosocial measures were included by psychologists and sociologists. Uh, including validated self-report measures and individual items that capture stressor exposures, so those are stressful events like getting divorced or the death of a loved one, and also subjective ratings of stress, which we call perceptions of stress or perceived stress. So asking about not just did an event happen, but how affected by that event were you? Uh, and it turns out from a psychological standpoint, a lot of empirical data is suggesting that this perception of stress is really important, equally as important as an objective measure of whether a stressful event happened. So it's essential that you capture not just whether the event happened, but also how impacted the person was by that event. The health and retirement study is one of the most comprehensive assessments of psychosocial stress in a population-based study. And it captures many different domains of stress. So as you can imagine, the term stress encompasses many different life experiences, um, including traumatic and life events, chronic stressors, such as caregiving for a spouse with dementia or Alzheimer's disease, childhood adversity, discrimination, loneliness, social isolation, social relationship strain, such as arguing frequently with family members, work stress, and neighborhood safety and cohesion. And the, there are many more domains uh, but of stress, but these are the ones that we focused on uh, categorizing within the health and retirement study because there were measures of all of these in HRF. Next slide. So the first thing, the first effort that was done, which was led by Tara Grunwald, was looking across HRS and nine other studies, including ELSA, SHARE, Hilda, JSTAR, CLOSA, Charles, Amhoff, and Krellis, across these different categories of stress domains to see which studies also have measures. Um, it, uh, also have measures in addition to HRS of these different stress domains. So that's what the table that we're showing you here is. It's showing you, for example, with the first uh, row saying stressful life events, many of the studies include, in fact, all of them include some measure of, a st of the stressful life events checklist. Um, some of them might be more limited. Whereas if you go to the next row, you'll see for chronic strains or chronic stress, uh, not, there are very few, there's only three studies that actually capture chronic stress. So this was, was our first initial attempt to see what do we actually have across these 10 groups of studies. Next slide. I recently published a paper with many colleagues who are involved in the uh, harmonization project 
where we looked to see within the health and retirement study, within these specific domains of stress, how many uh, publications have actually come out and taken advantage of the stress measures that are available. And in addition to kind of a review that looked at how many publications have come out, we highlighted some areas for future researchers to look at. So if you're interested in using these stress variables, I hope that you'll take a look at this publication because I think it provides a nice framework for identifying what are the gaps and what are the opportunities for using stress variables to answer important questions about how stress leads to different aging trajectories. Next slide. Uh, here is the list of the full HRS family of studies added for uh, similar measures. It is across the world. So we have the Costa Rican longitudinal study, the Korean uh, long, uh, study of aging and retirement, um, and the, the longitudinal study in India. So this really presents an incredible opportunity to look across nationally at relationships between health and aging outcomes. Next slide. The biggest resource that we have created on my side of the team um, is a user manual. So this was initially began by Tara Greenwald, and I've since refined it over the last um, year, where Tara, looked, Tara and her team looked at ev each one of those 10 studies at every single item across every single wave, and in this user manual described what each item is capturing and what of stress and which domain of stress it falls into. It also describes the response scale and some basic descriptive statistics about the item. And this is an incredible use resource because for those of you who have worked with these large data sets, it can be extremely hard to figure out where different items are, what waves they're captured in, what the exact wording is for each item. And so for the stress measures in particular, this user manual provides your first stop shop to figure out if the items you're interested in or the domain you're interested in for the study you want to explore, um, whether they actually exist or not, and what the specific items are and which waves they're at. This user manual uh, can be found at both the G2 Aging website and our Stress Measurement Network website and should be used in collaboration with the data code book that Dristin has really spearheaded. Um, and he will be showing you an example of that later on in the webinar. But together, the user manual and the data code book will describe the actual data and individual items for the harmonized variables that you may be interested in using. Next slide. This is an example of, an ama of the amazing resource that Dristin and his team have created at the Gateway to Global Aging. So what you're looking at is a screenshot from their G g2aging.org website. If you have not checked this out, please do. It's very user-friendly and it's just a treasure trove of information. But what you can see on the screen is that you're able to select the actual data that you're interested in using. So at the first row of buttons, you'll see which study you want. Uh, then you can select the years you're interested in. And soon to be added, you'll be able to specifically select which domains of stress are you interested in accessing. Before I go much further, I want to talk about what actually is harmonized data. Uh, so you don't have to look at the screen and know immediately what you're, what you're seeing. What I want to do here is highlight one example of what a harmonized item might look like. So this is from our childhood experience variable, where, which you can read at the very top row in the dark green, where it says childhood experience. And if, you're, if you go to the right on that same row, you see HRS for Health and Retirement Study, and then next you'll see ELSA, and next you'll see SHARE for the columns. And what, if you look at the highlighted yellow row, the item I'm sele I've selected here is called ever separated from your mother or father for six months or longer. Um, and this is all, because it's in the childhood experience, we know that this had to happen before age 18, and this is considered a stressful event in childhood if you're separated from a primary caregiver. So because this, uh, this item is included in multiple studies, 
and it is capturing some sort of stressful life event that happened in childhood, it's included in this Excel sheet. And what this, what the harmonization part is, is to look across in this screen, you're looking across HRS, ELSA, and SHARE, to see how was the item actually written and coded in each of these studies. So if you clicked to, to expand on the Excel cell um, under HRS 2015, you'll see that the response scale here is yes, no, um, and it was included in two different versions of the LH, which is the life history. In ELSA, it was also included, but instead of it being a yes, no, it was coded as, a, as the year in which it happened. So that right there, you're not able to compare those two variables immediately because they were on different response scales. But what Driston and our team worked together to do was to figure out how could those be harmonized? Well, it could be harmonized if we took the ELSA code and we changed that variable um, and created a new one where instead of just the year, it identified whether or not a yes, no for whether or not that happened, that did happen, whether or not the participant was ever separated from their mother or father for six months or longer. So then you would have within both HRS and ELSA uh, a harmonized variable, a yes, no in both studies that account for whether the participant was ever separated from their mother or father. So that's an example of what we did for every item for all of these stress domains across all of the studies, across all of the waves. So you can see that this is a really massive four-year-long project that we've been working on, and we're very excited to now just be releasing the data and are really hopeful that people will take advantage of it. Next slide. We believe that the potential of harmonized data is really great because you're able to look at differences in stress exposures and responses by geography, socio-demographic resources and groups, we can look at cultural differences in the association between stress exposures and responses and different aging outcomes, and we can replicate findings to see what relationships between stress and aging trajectories are universal and maybe, maybe which ones aren't and which ones are, are specific to different cultural groups or nations. The example that Driss is gonna walk us through today is using the discrimination measure. So we're focused primarily on HRS um, and looking at HRS and ELSA, and that's because these discrimination measures were easy, were easy to harmonize across. So it looks like there was some partnership when the um, ELSA and HRS were inserting these measures to make sure that they are similar enough um, uh, in order to be able to look at them in tandem. So we're able to do that. So if you are somebody who is interested in discrimination and you, you looked at this initial table of domains of stress assessed in each study and you said, oh, that's great. There are measures of discrimination in both HRS and ELSA. I wonder if those measures are the same. The next thing you would do, next slide, is go to this, the user guide that I described earlier. So this is called Measures of Stress in the Health and Retirement Study and the HRS Families of Studies. And when you get to your user guide, you would look up the discrimination section, next slide, and you would find a little description that Tara wrote where it talks about HRS and ELSA, both including measures of frequency of discrimination. And I've highlighted in yellow the part that says only the HRS and ELSA measures of everyday discrimination are comparable. The studies share five items across their assessments, and the internal consistency coefficients of each five-item aggregate indicate, indicate adequate internal reliability, and you can see the data um, for that. So that's one of the key parts um, that you would look for if you're interested in looking in exploring whether or not you're able to harmonize across these. Um, next slide. Then what you would do is you would go to another section where you actually want to see, well, which specific items are available in HRS and ELSA. So first here, you're looking at the section that's describing the discrimination variables available in HRS. And it also says a mean score was calculated for the first five items. So those are those bulleted items above. Um, in or, without the question about treatment from doctors, which is the final item uh, in the list of bullets in order to harmonize with ELSA. Next slide. 
And then you would see in the ELSA section, which was actually just right below the HRS section, where it describes that a subset of everyday discrimination items were added to ELSA at wave five. And again, you can see that these bulleted ones are the same as the ones in ELSA, uh, as the ones in HRS. Next slide. After you've gone to the user manual, you would then go to the data code book. So that's what this is that I'm showing you a picture of on the screen where it's talking about the harmonized ELSA documentation. So there's separate data code books for each of the um, different data sets. So you would have one for HRS and you would have one for ELSA. And when you look inside this data code book, next slide, what you would see is the actual variable names uh, and how the variables were constructed for these everyday discrimination items. So now you know the variable labels and you would also know how the, the aggregate score was created. So together between the user manual and the code book, you're able to really understand which variables you should be looking at if you're interested in everyday discrimination, how they overlap between the studies that you're interested in, and how they were created. So you have, should have all of the information you need to conduct the harmonized analyses looking at HRS and ELSA discrimination variables. So that was a lot, I'm sure, to ingest, but I hope that you are as excited about the potential of this data as we are. What we're, what we're gonna do next is take you through an example. So Dristen is gonna use those exact variables that I just introduced, the discrimination items, from HRS and ELSA and walk you through an analysis to show you how you would actually take advantage of this data uh, that has um, been prepared by both of our teams. So Dristen, with that, I will hand it over to you. And Dristen, if you want me to take any questions now, I'm happy to, or I can wait till the end. Sure, absolutely. Um, if anyone has any questions now, um, <clears throat> yeah, feel free to ask them. Um, and we're gonna kind of transition to the um, SATA portion. Um, thank you for that overview, um, Alexandra, about teaching us about how uh, these kind of variables um, <clears throat> came to be added to these studies and then were incorporated um, into our harmonized data sets. Um, also, uh, Alexandra will be around at the end of the call also, so if you'd like to ask questions, then um, you can do that also. So I think the best way to kind of understand how to use these harmonized um, data sets and harmonized variables uh, is just to like, think of a, an example research question and to start to use them. Um, so that's what we're gonna do. So our kind of research question that we're gonna be looking at today uh, is gonna be, is there a relationship between discrimination and mental health? Uh, and is it the same across different educational groups? Um, so as Alexander mentioned, one of uh, the questions, um, <clears throat> the sets of questions that were included uh, in both HRS and ELSA were questions about the experience of discrimination. Uh, and in particular, kind of um, a scale of how much ex uh, discrimination they experience um, in different uh, ways that people possibly experience discrimination. Um, <clears throat> there's a, a, some literature uh, that does talk about the experience of discrimination and the um, effect that it has on people's mental health. Mental health questions are also included um, in these studies, so we can look at that. Um, and then I thought what might be interesting to do um, is to look at whether we can um, look at a, a separate factor, something like um, educational attainment, uh, to see whether that has um, any effect, any, um, uh, or whether we just see a correlation between different um, educational levels um, and the relationship between discrimination and mental health. Uh, because you could imagine that perhaps people with higher levels of education uh, could be more protected um, from kind of the negative effects of discrimination on their mental health as they have more uh, kind of personal and uh, social and um, occupational resources. Uh, so our first, uh, we're gonna do this using the harmonized HRS. Uh, so uh, the harmonized HRS is developed here um, at the Gateway to Global Aging Data. Uh, it is a supplement to an existing um, data set called the RAND HRS which is developed by the RAND Corporation. Um, and uh, the RAND HRS um, uh, is, a, is a, a great data set that has been used. Um, almost all of the research that comes out of the HRS uh, is based on the RAND HRS because it's so user-friendly. 
Um, so the red HRS will always be your kind of starting point for doing some harmonized analysis with the HRS. Um, briefly, uh, when I say harmonized, I kind of mean uh, that the, the variables and the data sets are designed uh, to be comparable across different waves of each study and to be comparable across different studies themselves. So if you're unfamiliar with that term, that's what that means. Um, so we're going to download the um, RAND HRS data set and the harmonized HRS data set. We can identify our relevant harmonized variables in both of those data sets to answer our analysis question. We're going to create a few additional variables. Uh, we'll apply weights, and we can talk about that. Uh, and then we're going to kind of do two analysis steps. So we're going to analyze depression uh, by discrimination level first. So just whether we see uh, any relationship between depression level and the amount of discrimination a person reports experiencing. And then we're also going uh, to do that same, look at that relationship, but let's look at it for different educational groups uh, to see whether uh, we're seeing different patterns for people of different educational groups. Uh, so to download the uh, RAND HRS, uh, they are both available uh, from the HRS data downloads. Uh, and there is a, a long link there to get to the HRS um, data downloads. Uh, you can also find this link uh, on our website. So if you go to uh, g2aging.org, that is the gateway to global aging data, uh, you can see here that we have uh, this tab called download at the top right. Uh, and in this first column here, you can see links um, to download survey data, and then in the second one, uh, to download uh, harmonized data sets. Uh, so you can download uh, for both of these, uh, you, they'll take you to the same place, uh, which is to the University of Michigan website. Uh, you will need to register there. Registration is like really uh, quite simple. Uh, and once you're registered, uh, you can get access to both of these. Um, I'll go ahead and sign in just so we can see what it looks like. Um, uh, so we have uh, here on the right, we have RAND contributed files, and we can see we're going to be using the RAND HRS longitudinal file. Uh, and from uh, Gateway Harmonized Data, we're going to be using Harmonized HRS uh, version B. So that's how you'll get access to this data set. Uh, and to access most of the harmonized data sets, so the procedure is very similar um, to this one I just showed you. So now that we've got our data, um, <clears throat> Oh, and uh, once you have your data, uh, we do ask when using any harmonized um, data set, uh, we have a requested citation. This citation is found in each harmonized um, code book. Uh, the code books are also available uh, as part of the data download. So when you download the data, you get the code book with it. I, I will show you an example of the code books. Um, and I didn't mention this, but registration um, is free. Uh, and if you'd also like to register for multiple studies, so instead of just using the HRS, let's say you'd like to use a lot of studies at once, uh, we actually built a tool to do that so you're not uh, giving the same information to each study. Uh, and you can find that here at the top of the data downloads page, and we call that our universal access to study data. Uh, so you can go through and you can say, well, I, I know I'd like to uh, use data from HRS, from the US, and from Mexico for IMHAS, and uh, SHARE for Europe. Uh, you can select these. Uh, or you could select all. Uh, and what we'll do is we'll build a form for you that you fill out and we'll submit that on your behalf to the studies. And you'll get an email um, uh, confirming your registration if you'd like to do that at one um, point. Uh, one caveat on this page is it doesn't currently allow you to register for ELSA data. Uh, so you do have to do that um, through the UK data service. Um, that's a, a data bank that the UK government runs and they distribute the ELSA data. Um, so next thing we're going to do is identify our relevant variables. Um, and for this webinar, we're going to kind of doing a cross-sectional analysis. So we're just going to look at one year. Um, <clears throat> if you remember from Alexander's um, uh, slides, uh, that the discrimin discrimination questions in ELSA were only asked um, at wave five. It's just one wave. Uh, and that was uh, in 2010. So we're just going to pick the same year for the HRS so that we can compare these when we get to this, the third part of this webinar. So our year of interest is going to be 2010. <clears throat> so from the RAND HRS, we're going to, uh, we're going to get um, a measure of uh, a CESD score. Um, <clears throat> that's a common scale that's used um, to measure mental health or depression. Uh, we'll get an analysis weight. 
We'll also get a clustering variable and a stratum variable. Uh, and these are helpful because uh, the HRS, as many of these surveys, uses um, a, com a complex survey design. Uh, so it's important to, uh, when you produce any estimates, uh, to be able to tell the program um, about how those um, samples were drawn so you can get corrected standard errors. Um, <clears throat> otherwise, your standard errors can be um, uh, can appear smaller than they should be. Uh, and then from the harmonized HRS, so that data set that we produce here as a supplement to the RAN HRS, uh, we're going to use you know, two variables. One is the respondent uh, discrimination mean score, and the other is the respondent uh, education level. So if you're wondering where to find these, I, I, I think there's two uh, good places to find them. Um, <clears throat> so starting at the uh, HRS, if you click uh, at the gateway to global aging data, uh, if you click on surveys at a glance, you can see here on the right, we have a searched data by subtopic. Um, so we can say that we're going to use the RAND HRS uh, here, and we're going to use it in 2010. And then we could identify those things that were important to us. Uh, so for instance, we know we wanted some analysis weights. Uh, let's see, we also, uh, we wanted a level of education, right? So we have an education variable there. <laughs> Uh, and then we also wanted a depressive scale, right? That CESD score. So we can find that under health. And we can find a CESD there, or EuroD is the European version of that, um, which is not asked as part of the address. Uh, we can search that. And what we'll get is a list of the different uh, variable names that would apply to us. So for instance, uh, these are all uh, uh, wave 10 variables because we said that we wanted wave 10. We can see we've got a years of education variable. Um, so that's helpful, a type of education variable. Um, if we look at health here, we've got individual CESD questions, uh, but we've also got uh, a total CESD score. That's what we'll use. Uh, and if we scroll back up, we could see in the harmonized HRS, uh, we have a harmonized education level, uh, which we can use. Um, and as Alexander mentioned, uh, we don't currently have uh, the stress variables built into here. So you cannot... Um, search across all the studies for the stress variables. Uh, we will be adding that really soon. We've released stress variables so far uh, in HRS and ELSA, and then really over the next um, year to year and a half, we're gonna be adding them to each additional data set as that data is updated. Um, so probably um, fairly soon next year for those studies which have the stress variables available, you'll be able to use the search also to find those stress variables you want. So for instance, you could, uh, type stress discrimination, we could get those discrimination variables from both. Uh, so that's one way. The other way uh, is just to use um, the uh, code books that Alexander mentioned. Uh, so for instance, um, here is uh, the uh, kind of cover page, make that a little smaller for you, for the harmonized SHRS documentation. Uh, these do include bookmarks, uh, so we can go down, you can see section M is our stress uh, section. Uh, uh, in all of the harmonized code books for the different studies, uh, it will always be section M for stress. Uh, you can see if we scroll down here, we have uh, a section called everyday discrimination. Uh, and we can see all the variables that were created um, as part of that for discrimination, uh, including this discrimination summary mean score. And we can see we have that in wave 10. So that's what we're going to use. So I think. Um, you know, using the harmonized code books or this search um, on the um, gateway to global aging data are a great place to find what are the variables that are relevant to you. Uh, the other thing that you can do uh, is uh, all the variables have uh, labels in them. So if you just open up the entire data set um, in Stata, you could also just kind of search there for the variables. Uh, but you won't get as much information um, as you would get uh, certainly using the code books and even using the gateway to global aging data search. <clears throat> so now we're going to start uh, with a little Stata code. So I'm going to bring in some Stata code. If you did want to follow along, this is where you could do that uh, using that file. So uh, I'm going to open up Stata here. Um, let me change the uh, change our color scheme. Should I make it a little easier on the eyes? All right, there we go. Uh, and so let's open up, let's go to um, uh, do, we're going to do this file <clears throat> that we have here and I've saved this um, on my desktop and stress webinar and that's that advanced stress webinar 2018 do file. A do file is just what you call a Stata program file. 
I mean, that's that file that I provided you as part of the Hangouts. Um, so we can um, we can just open that up, uh, and it's going to start running. One of the things that I've done uh, uh, in this file uh, is that I put in pauses. Um, so you can run it just to this point, uh, and then you can type Q, uh, and you can just jump to the next step. Uh, you could also kind of um, play around uh, with things in between the steps if you'd like to kind of check things. It's one of the a useful features in, inside of Stata, and particularly for doing a webinar like this. Um, so let's go back and we can look at our, our Stata code here um, back on our slide. So we're going to load the rand hrs variables. Uh, and we're going to do that uh, with this load command uh, that's called use inside of Stata. We're going to list those variables we want. You'll notice we also include the variable hhidpn. That's the unique person level identifier inside of the HRS. Um, and that's really important uh, because we want to always keep the unique identifiers in a variable, in a data set, uh, so that you can merge them with any other data sets. Uh, and you can see in this next step, we're going to merge with the um, harmonized HRS. But also if you wanted to bring in some other HRS data, because not all the HRS um, data are included in the RAND HRS and the harmonized HRS, uh, so you want to make sure that you can still bring those in, leave those linkages possible. Uh, so back to this first step, we're going to uh, use these variables, and we're going to say using, and this is the name of the RAN HRS data, longitudinal data set uh, currently. Uh, you can also just bring in the entire data set. Uh, one of the helpful things about structuring uh, your, your load or use command this way is that it's only going to bring in these uh, six ver these five variables here from the RAN HRS. And the RAN HRS is a really big file because the H it's a longitudinal file, so it has always included, um, and it's structured in a FAT format. So there's a variable for each wave for the 12 waves of HRS that are included. Um, so depending on the version of Stata that you have, it could be too big to open up inside of Stata on your own. So this command can be quite helpful for opening just a limited portion depending on the version of Stata you have. Uh, the next thing we're going to do is we're going to merge in the harmonized HRS. Um, what, what a merge command assumes is that the observations um, that you are bringing in from a new data set should be or can be matched um, to at least some of the observations uh, from the data that's already in Stata memory. Uh, so we're going to say merge one to one, meaning uh, that for every one observation in the existing data set, that RAN HRS data, there would just be one observation uh, from the harmonized HRS data set. They're both individual level data sets, so that's exactly how they're structured. Uh, we're going to say merge on HHITPN. And we're going to say uh, using the HHRS data. And in this case, we can say, uh, we can add the option of keep using, and we'll just list our two variables here. So we're only going to get those two variables. Uh, if we jump over to Stata, uh, you can see here that we, I think we've just got uh, our seven variables here from HHITPN to discrimination uh, for each of those. Um, uh, we could also, at this step, we could uh, investigate any of these variables. Uh, for instance, uh, we could tab R-A-E-D-U-C-L. Uh, that's our harmonized education level. Um, let me do that once more for a prettier output. Uh, so you can see that education levels are divided up uh, into three parts. It's less than upper secondary, uh, which in the U.S. would mean just less than a high school degree. Um, uh, upper secondary and vocational training, so people who finished high school or had some vocational training, uh, and then tertiary, meaning people who went to college um, or more than college. Um, so that's kind of how that uh, how that variable operates. So you could play around with how those variables look there. <clears throat> we can also create additional variables here. Um, so as I mentioned, the discrimination variable that we're going to use is a mean discrimination score. So people were asked five different questions uh, for this variable around discrimination, uh, and they answered on a scale. Um, <clears throat> so if we go back um, to our Stata window, uh, we could, let's just uh, look at some summary statistics about that discrimination variable. Uh, so you can see it ranges from one uh, to six. Uh, six, uh, all our discrimination variables and stress variables have, uh, the summary variables have higher stress as the higher number. Um, so I think a person with a six in this is someone who, uh, for all the five items of this, reported the most stress, for instance, because this is a mean score. Um, one of the things you'll also notice uh, is that there is uh, 8,221 observations. 
Um, so that's actually uh, much less than the full HRS sample. Uh, so you might be wondering why that is. It's always important to think about missing data uh, when doing analysis. So if we tabulate um, this variable, so let's tab that and we'll include the missing option. We can find out some more information. Um, so you can see here, because this is a uh, mean summary score, we've got a lot of, uh, a lot of um, it's a continuous variable really. It's not often tabulated. But once we scroll down to those um, missing values, so you can see a couple of things. One is that we have people who are blank missing. Um, so these blank missing people are people who were not part of wave, uh, wave 10 of the HRS, right? So they have no value for this. You can also see we have a lot of people who have .c, right? So there's 13,000 people here, which is quite large. Uh, and why that is is because this question was only asked to half of the HRS sample, basically. Um, <clears throat> so it's going to be missing uh, for, for a lot of people, which is why uh, even though we do have 37,000 people as part of um, uh, the full longitudinal HRS uh, sample, we only have um, this measure, as I said before, for 8,000. So that's a great thing to be aware of. Uh, so we're going to create um, uh, tertiles, just meaning uh, three kind of um, <clears throat> uh, e equally um, uh, distributed groups here. We're going to do that using an x-tile command. Uh, so we're going to say uh, uh, x-tile, we're going to create a variable, which is a tertile variable in this case. And we're going to call this variable r10 uh, uh, discrimination tert. And we're going to base this on the um, <clears throat> r10 uh, discrim5 variable. We're also going to um, uh, go ahead and tell Stata here what is the weight that's used uh, to weight these individuals. Um, <clears throat> this is important for a lot of reasons. Uh, one is that the HRS includes an oversample of African American um, and Latino people. Uh, so we want to make sure that when we're separating these, um, uh, that we're giving uh, those people the appropriate weights as people and as for people who are not part of that sample. Uh, there could also be, of course, there's, um, uh, there's bias and uh, non-response bias and who doesn't uh, return a survey or fill out a survey or who drops out of the survey. Uh, so if we type Q here in Stata, we can create that. Uh, we could just tabulate that variable quickly and see a little more information about that. So we can see we have three groups here. So three levels of discrimination. Our group one here would be people with low discrimination. Um, two is kind of in the mean, in the middle of the distribution discrimination. And uh, our third group here is going to be people um, <clears throat> Uh, with uh, high levels of, of discrimination relative to the other people in the HRS sample. Uh, and we have this again for 7,000 people, a little over 7,000. Uh, next, we're going to apply our weights. So we're going to do this using SVY set. One of the helpful things about Stata is that once you tell Stata uh, how your sampling um, and your weighting should be de uh, done, you don't have to continue to re-enter this information. So we're going to use the command SVY set. Uh, we'll specify our cluster variable, uh, which is R A E H uh, H SAMP in the HRS. We're going to be using uh, this person level anal cross sectional analysis weight called R10 WTRSP. And we'll specify our strata variable, our strata variable, <clears throat> which is R A E S T R A T. Uh, so we can uh, do that in Stata. Uh, we can also find out uh, a little more information about that with the SVY uh, describe variable. Uh, so you can see that uh, we have uh, 26 um, strata, and you can see for uh, uh, for each stratum, um, what are the number of observations in each one of those. Um, so now that that information is in Stata, we can just start to produce some estimates. So the first thing we could do is we could um, estimate a CSD score for everyone uh, who has discrimination info. Again, uh, we know that uh, we don't have discrimination uh, info for anyone who wasn't part of wave 10, this particular wave of HRS, and also for anyone who wasn't part of this subsample of the, of the HRS wave 10 sample who was asked this question. Uh, so we can tell Stata uh, SVY that says, recall what I told you in SVY set. So recall that weighting, that stratification, that clustering, those variables. And we're going to specify only for the subpopulation uh, who have a value for uh, the discrimination tertile variable, right? So we're going to say, if not missing, 
a discrimination tertile value. Uh, and then we're going to get the mean score of R10 CSD, that variable. <clears throat> we could also do that separately for individuals uh, with a low discrimination uh, experience, reported low discrimination experience, or for respondents who reported that high discrimination experience. Uh, so in this case, all we need to do here is in our subpopulation, we just need to specify, uh, create this estimate only it, under the condition that for the second one that R10 discrimination TERT is equal equal to one. And for the, the high discrimination group, R10 discrimination TERT is equal equal to three. Uh, so let's um, jump back into Stata, and we can see uh, what that looks like. So first, uh, when we estimate for everyone, uh, we can see uh, that we estimate a discrimination, a CSD score of 1. Um, maybe 1, 1. 1.3 for everyone in the HRS sample. Of course, the HRS sample is um, uh, of American adults who are uh, age um, older than 50, so 51 and older. Uh, we can then also estimate that uh, for people who have uh, low discrimination, as we saw, uh, based on our tertiles. So we would estimate, uh, on average, they would report kind of, or they would uh, have a, just a value of one for their CSD um, <clears throat> uh, kind of mental health uh, score. And for people with high discrimination, what we see here uh, is a much higher estimate, right? So one point, uh, really 1.8. So it does look kind of um, significantly um, different. Uh, we can test whether that difference that we're seeing for that low uh, uh, discrimination, high level discrimination groups are different. Uh, and we can do this <clears throat> with just a few lines of Stata code. Uh, so one thing we can do is we can estimate for all groups of discrimination. So for all three groups of discrimination, a mean uh, CESD score, you would do that just using this command here, starting again with SVY and adding the option of over discrimination TERT. And what that'll do is it'll produce a separate estimate uh, for each category of discrimination TERT. And then we can test the differences between those estimates uh, using this test command, which does a post estimation test based on the estimate that you just produced inside of Stata. So if we jump back inside of Stata, um, the first thing we can see here is that we, uh, uh, in that uh, estimation command, so we get our three values. Uh, of course, we saw the value for our low level uh, being at one uh, estimated CESD score and for a high level being at 1.8 estimated CESD score. Uh, and for uh, the middle group here, we would estimate a 1.1 uh, uh, CESD score. And then we can test the difference. Uh, Stata is gonna do an adjusted wall test in this case. Uh, and really what we're doing is we're saying test the assumption uh, that uh, estimate one here is equal to uh, estimate three here, so that they're that they're equal to each other. And in this case, we can see looking at our F, our probability greater than F, our p-value here, uh, is that it uh, we would not we would estimate that these two estimates are statistically uh, significantly different. Um, so we are seeing something here. Uh, if we wanted to look at this graphically, uh, which is sometimes much nicer, um, one of the things that we see is that um, for our our low and uh, middle levels of discrimination in individuals, um, it's really it looks uh, much more similar. But what we see is when we get into those people who report experiencing high discrimination, uh, they also do uh, seem to uh, <clears throat> seem to experience uh, more mental health or depression issues. Uh, and I remember, uh, if you remember, we said we wanted to look at uh, depression scale for different levels of education. So we can do this really quickly. This is one of the nice things about Stata. So our command is going to look exactly like it did before, of SVY uh, mean R2, R10 CSD. And in our over option, we're going to have, of course, um, <clears throat> our discrimination tertile variable, but also our education levels. Remember, we have three education levels. Um, and so what this will produce uh, inside of state, if we do this, uh, is going to be nine different estimates because we have um, uh, we have uh, three education groups, three levels of, of discrimination. Uh, so we can produce these estimates. Uh, and if we look at this, um, <clears throat> uh, and then we could test whether these differences. So one question might be, uh, we could test whether there are significant differences between individuals 
uh, with low and high levels of discrimination who have low education, right? So people we think might not be protected, do we still see that difference as a check? And then let's look for people, uh, whether there's a significant difference um, from high and low discrimination individuals, but when those high and low discrimination individuals both have high education. So people we, we might think uh, could kind of be maybe protected from the experience of discrimination. So we can do that using um, two post estimation commands. Um, so inside of Stata here for the first one, uh, we can see that for that low education group, uh, that there is a statistically significant difference um, <clears throat> in our estimate of their CSD score uh, for people who have low and high levels of discrimination. Uh, and then let's look for those people with high education. Uh, and one of those things that we see is that it's also statistically significantly different. Even, at, even with people who have high education, um, <clears throat> we can look at this uh, graphically. Um, which shows us a couple uh, important points. Uh, one is that we do see kind of CSD on a level um, uh, decreasing with more education. So it does seem like we're seeing kind of a relationship between education level and CSD. But looking within each of these education groups, what we can also see is that at every single level of education that we're looking at, the experience of discrimination does seem to be significantly correlated uh, with having a higher level of CESD. So it's not operating as kind of the protective measure that we might think uh, giving people more social capital in a, which, in a way that they could kind of avoid the experience or some of the consequences of discrimination that they experience. So for the second part or our third part uh, of the webinar, we're going to do really what we did and quite quickly because we're using harmonized data, but we're going to uh, we're going to add in another study here of the harmonized ELSA. So we're going to look at this kind of same relationship between discrimination and mental health across different education groups, but we're going to do that for both the U.S. and the United States. Uh, our steps are going to be quite similar uh, to they were for just the HRS. Um, so we're going to download the harmonized ELSA. We're going to find those relevant variables. That would be just the same way that we did um, for the uh, harmonized HRS variables. Uh, one of the new steps here is we're going to create a pooled data set. So we're going to have observations from both studies in the same, in the same data set. We're going to prepare our variables. Uh, we're going to apply weights, and we can talk about how to use weights from different studies. And then we're going to do kind of our two steps of analysis. Again, uh, in this case, they're going to be analyzing depression by discrimination level across different countries first, and then doing it across different countries for different educational groups. You can download the Harmonized ELSA, uh, as I mentioned, uh, from the UK Data Service. Uh, that link, again, can be found um, from the download uh, page of the Gateway to Global Aging Data, uh, just going uh, here for Harmonized ELSA on that second row for ELSA. <clears throat> and you can sign up to register for the UK Data Archive. Again, it's free and quite quick, uh, which is uh, true for every single um, Harmonized uh, data set and Harmonized study. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, uh, we're gonna, uh, these discrimination questions were only asked in ELSA Wave 5, uh, so our year of interest here is going to be 2010, and we're going to get these same variables. Uh, one of the nice things that you'll see in using harmonized variables is that they have the same name already because they were asked the same. So our discrimination mean score variable, uh, besides having a 5 for Wave 5, has exactly the same name. Our CSD score has exactly the same name. Our education variable has exactly the same name. Um, so we're going to collect those variables, and and you could find those again using the code books or using the concordant or using the uh, the harmonized subtopic search on the gateway to global aging data. So let's create a pooled data set with variables from both harmonized um, data sets. So the first thing we're going to do is we've already done some work on this HRS data. So we're just going to save that as is in place right now. Um, <clears throat> but we're going to create a temporary file just so it, it clears itself out when we end data and we'll save it. We're going to call that HRS. Uh, then we're going to bring in our harmonized ELSA data. So we're going to say use. Again, we want to say IDA unique, which is the unique identifier in ELSA in case we ever want to merge in other ELSA data. Uh, so we're going to use those. And then we're going to append that HRS data we just saved. Um, so what append does um, is unlike merge, append assumes that the observations you're bringing in 
don't match any of your current observations. We know that no one can be in the HRS study and in the ELSA study because they're in separate countries. So we're gonna put the observations um, for HRS below those observations for ELSA. Uh, we can also, we wanna make sure we remember uh, which observations represent um, the HRS and or which come from the HRS representing the US and which come from ELSA representing England. Um, so we're gonna take this append variable that we made uh, and we're gonna create, uh, just change that into a country identifier. So we can identify England or USA. Uh, so we'll know where those variables are coming from. <clears throat> so let's go to that step inside of Stata. All right, so we can tab our country variable to find a little bit more information. Uh, you can see that we've got 37,000 um, people. That's the full HRS sample, right? Anyone who is at any wave of the HRS. And we've got 18,000 um, respondents uh, for England. So we've got uh, great numbers um, for both of those, uh, those studies. <clears throat> uh, the next thing we want to do is, is for else, so we've already done this for the HRS, we're going to create our tertiles of mean discrimination score. And this is going to look exactly like um, how we did this uh, for ELSA, except, of course, we're just going to use the R5 variables because uh, we know those apply to ELSA and not the HRS. Um, <clears throat> we can go to that step. Uh, we could uh, tabulate uh, our ELSA wave 5 discrimination variable for a little more information. Uh, we can see we have this uh, for um, almost 8,000 people there uh, and how it's dispersed. Uh, uh, one thing to note is that because we're recording, uh, we're creating these two tertile variables separately, it means we're really looking at the relative experience of discrimination inside of each country independently. Right, so we cannot assume that people who report um, high discrimination um, in England is similar to reporting what we're calling high discrimination in the US. Uh, it's just relative to the people in that country. Uh, another way to cut this would be to look at both of them uh, and do it, um, but that's not how we're going to uh, do it for this webinar. Uh, the next thing we're gonna do is uh, quite simple, but we're gonna adjust um, our differing wave numbers in the variable names. Um, so if you recall, our <clears throat> CSD score, for instance, variable had a 5 in it for ELSA and a 10 in it for the US. So we're just going to make a new variable called R10CSD because we know that it's um, uh, for uh, everyone is in 2010. And we can assign the uh, wave 5 variables if you're from uh, England, which we can use our country variable uh, uh, to, to subset that, and R10 variable if you're from uh, the US. So we can do that for um, <clears throat> our CSD variable, our discrimination tertile variable. We can do that for our weight variable. And the last thing we're going to do is we have strata and cluster variables from both data sets. Uh, so we're going to make a combined strata and cluster variable. But one thing that we want to do uh, is we want to make sure that if there are strata or or cluster variables which are overlapping, so, so values which are overlapping, you know, so maybe the, in this uh, in this case, they could both have a strata which was labeled the value of one, for instance. That does not mean that these are the same thing, and we want Stata to know that. So we're gonna kind of create a new variable, uh, which will be uh, called uh, strata in this case, and we're gonna use this group command which just says for each country independently and for each group of strata uh, from these two strata variables, create new categories. Uh, we're gonna do that even if missing because we actually know that there'll always be one missing value because uh, there is no one uh, who has a value both from the HRS and for ELSA. Uh, and then we can say, if you're missing both of them, um, don't assign a value. We'll do that same thing for strata and cluster. Let's do that inside of Stata. Also, just had we uh, saw we had a question, and they said, uh, "When uh, will the stress variables be added to the G2 Aging Tables page?" Um, I'll briefly jump over to our website so you can see what we're talking about. Uh, so, uh, on our concordance page, I, I assume that's what you mean by tables. Uh, you can see that we have them here. So, we do have some stress variable, uh, some stress tables already here. Um, we don't have all of them currently, but you can see for lots of things uh, like the, let's see, we could look at uh, job stress, uh, which studies use the Kaiser job content questionnaire. We already have a table you can look at here uh, for how comparable uh, these are across different studies. Uh, you can also see at the bottom here, for instance, these questions are not asked in 
uh, M. Haas, Tilda, and Charles. Uh, so I hope that answers your question. We, you also can see here we don't have kind of the, the uh, experience of discrimination questions here. So we'll, we'll be adding those kind of as we begin this push of releasing all of these stress variables. Um, but some of those tables are already there. All right, so we've made uh, all our variables there, uh, <clears throat> kind of adjusted our um, numbering. Uh, we're going to uh, use the SVY uh, set command again to apply our weights. Uh, and in this case, because we've already separated our cluster and strata, we've defined them inside of our country, we can just list them this way. We can use our combined weight. And one thing that we're gonna have to do is we're gonna have to tell Stata a little bit more information, uh, which is we're gonna have to say single unit centered. Um, and I'll just really briefly say what that means. Um, so there are certain um, strata inside of um, ELSA, in this case actually, where there's only one person. Um, uh, and so what uh, these kind of extra commands tell Stata is how to adjust the standard errors. Who are the people who are more related to each other inside of a strata? But if there's only one person, they're not able to do that. Uh, so when you uh, so when you take all these single unit strata individuals, you're going to center them as one group and then produce your estimate. So uh, there are different options here. I'm not going to go into them for the purposes of time, uh, but it is something you want to be aware of, um, in particular with using ELSA. Uh, so the first thing we can do is we can estimate uh, CSD score across just different countries. Uh, and then we could estimate it uh, by discrimination levels um, <clears throat> across the different countries. Our commands are going to look really similar here. Again, we're going to say that SVY, uh, our sub pop is going to be uh, if not missing our discrimination tertile, because we know for the HRS, uh, there are going to be people who have a, a CSD value who don't have a discrimination value. Um, <clears throat> and we can do that over country. And then in the next step, we can do that over country and over discrimination tertile. Um, so let's jump over to Stata and we can do that. Uh, so the first thing we can see is that uh, we do estimate uh, that uh, for England, we would estimate a kind of 1.5 CESD score and for the US, a 1.28 uh, discrimination score. <clears throat> Um, and then we can look at that also uh, across different um, uh, levels of discrimination. Again, they're not comparable levels, but they're relative inside of each country. Um, <clears throat> and we get uh, six estimates in this case because we have um, three levels of discrimination in two different countries. Uh, and we can look at that graphically. Here we go. Uh, <clears throat> one of the things that you'll uh, that we do see is that it does look like. Uh, people with high levels of discrimination in both England and the U.S. Um, are kind of uh, <clears throat> reporting uh, 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 are having higher levels of um, CSD score, meaning higher kind of mental uh, mental or depressive issues. The next thing we can do is we could estimate CSD score by discrimination level for individuals at different levels of education across countries. So we're going to be producing, we're kind of slicing this data even one more way. And how we're going to do that is just using the exact same command, but in our over option, uh, we're going to add <clears throat> our education level, our R-A-E-D-U-C-L. So if we jump into this data as we wrap up, uh, you can see we're going to get 18 estimates, again, because we have two countries, three levels of discrimination, three levels of education. And we're going to get an estimate for each of those. And we could compare any of these estimates um, to each other uh, to see whether they're significant. Um, <clears throat> as we wrap up, I think we'll just uh, look at this graphically. Uh, so one of the things that we can see here um, <clears throat> is that it does look, uh, if we look particularly at this third group of columns, so that's, um, uh, there's a people in England with tertiary education, <clears throat> that people who experience high levels of discrimination uh, again, we do see that uh, both in England and in the U.S. Uh, that they do experience, um, uh, they, they do kind of uh, have a higher CSD scores, um, uh, meaning more depressive issues or mental health issues. So it's not kind of the protective measure. Education is not that we thought that it might be around discrimination. Um, thank you for everyone who joined for the webinar. I know we ran a little bit over time. Uh, my apologies. 
Um, if you have any questions um, or you want to check out more about the harmonized data or find out what's available, you can do that at the Gateway to Global Aging Data. That's u2aging.org. Uh, we also have a help desk. So if you're having um, trouble kind of navigating the gateway or getting access to harmonized data sets or doing your analysis or just finding out what's available in these studies or uh, maybe you're interested in using a particular data set and you want to know when those stress variables will be added, you can always email us and that's help at g2aging.org. Uh, that is also included uh, on the G2Aging website. Uh, we have this help tab. Uh, we have some frequently asked questions that could be helpful. Uh, and then you can see here we've got help at G2Aging. Uh, briefly, if you're interested in downloading the video or the slides or this data code from today, they will be made available on the documentation tab on the Gateway to Global Aging Data under recent presentations. Um, so within the next 24 hours after this webinar, we'll upload a version of these, um, of the slides, of the video, uh, and of the data code here. So you can download that. Um, <clears throat> and we encourage you, uh, uh, if you're if you're saying to someone else, they can also all, always follow up with questions later. Um, so I think uh, Alexandra and I will take uh, some questions now, if anyone has any questions. Uh, we hope uh, website uh, this webinar was informative today and kind of helps you um, get an idea about the, these new stress variables we created, which uh, we're quite excited about. Um, so if anyone has any questions, you can ask that in the question box or the chat box, uh, or you can raise your hand um, and I will unmute you uh, and you can just ask that question out loud. Uh, and while we're waiting to see if there's any questions, I will mention, um, I think when you log off from the webinar, uh, there is an, an, an interactive, I mean, a, um, a survey we asked you about the webinar, um, just to give us some more feedback if you like this webinar and if it was helpful. Um, uh, so if you don't mind filling that out, that would uh, be great. Uh, we'd like uh, your, uh, your feedback on this webinar. And you can also suggest uh, new topics for other webinars if there's something else you'd like to see that we didn't cover. All right, so we have a couple questions. Um, uh, so uh, David clarified, uh, I meant if the stress variables will be added to the graphs and tables output tab. Um, yeah, yes, uh, I apologize for misunderstanding you. We do have two, two different sets of tables. Uh, so I didn't mention this um, uh, today, but we do have a graphs and tables portion of the gateway to global aging data where, uh, where we'll kind of generate statistics for you around um, for different uh, survey measures in different countries and you can select the year and the subpopulation. Uh, uh, and David is right that we currently don't have as part of our topics those stress variables. Uh, so we will be adding those um, uh, soon. I think I think we usually try to wait until the variables are available in at least three studies uh, kind of before we add them here. Um, so I think it probably won't, it, my guess is it would be sometime early next year that we would add these um, as we kind of release the next data set with uh, stress variables, um, which would probably be maybe share would probably be next. Um, and then we could add these here and then you could go ahead and for those countries as we add them, uh, you could generate these statistics. Um, <clears throat> you could generate certain statistics around uh, stress here. You can uh, see an example. Uh, uh, here about working for pay so you, uh, over different time in England uh, in the US. Uh, so we will add those, uh, but it will be uh, probably early next year. Uh, and uh, let's see, Michelle asks a question. Um, are there any biological uh, mar uh, measures of stress? If so, are these harmonized as well? Um, Alexander, this might be a better question um, for you to answer as far as whether they were collected. Um Yes, that's a great question. I know in the HRS they were collected um, in a subsample, and I'm, I'm not familiar with the biomarkers that are available in the other data sets. Um, the idea of harmonizing across those would be um, my initial reaction is that we wouldn't be able to do that because one of the main things with biomarkers is how were they collected and assayed, and that they if they're not assayed at the same 
uh, site location, then the idea of, um, you know, the, the, they're just going to be very different. They're also going to have been collected differently. Um, but absolutely, you could look at relationships between, let's say, uh, biomarkers such as inflammation and some sort of stress measure across a variety of studies and see how the relationships um, are similar or different. But as of right now, I'm not familiar enough with the other studies to say whether there are biomarkers in anything other than HRS. Great question. Yeah, I also don't know off the top of my head. I do know that they are biomarkers are collected for a lot of the studies, but I don't know in particular whether biological measures of stress are collected. Um, a lot of the studies will take a dried blood spot um, or venous blood, uh, but uh, they kind of choose independently, um, you know, what are the, the measurements that they release to the public outside of those. Uh, I also mentioned for a lot of those, um, especially blood-based biomarkers, uh, that uh, they do require special access, so they're not part of just the public data. Um, and so often for the harmonized data sets, we focus just on what's publicly available. Um, <clears throat> but it's definitely interesting. I think a lot of great work can come out of that. And, uh, and as Alexander said, it is available for the HRS. Um, are there any other questions? All right. Well, if there's not any other questions, thank you. Uh, thank you all so much um, for joining us. Um, if you have additional questions um, that me or Alexander can mention, again, we can use that. Uh, you can use that help desk email, and we'll get those um, to the right person. There's a whole team of people um, here at the Gateway, and uh, as part of the Stress Network, who would be able to um, to provide you uh, help if you're interested in getting to use these variables. Um, so thank you. And I would just like to say, uh, Dristen, I also want to say to feel free to email me. I'm at alexandra.crosswell yes. at ucsf.edu. Um, if you have any follow-up questions about the Stress Measurement Network, uh, I would love to answer them. That sounds great. All right. Well, thank you all. I hope you all have a great day. All right. Goodbye.